Our scripture this morning is from Romans chapter 8, and verses 22 through 27. We know that all of creation is still groaning and is in pain like a woman about to give birth. The Spirit makes us sure about what we will be in the future, but now we groan silently while we wait for God to show that we are God's children. This means that our bodies will also be set free, and this hope is what saves us. But if we already have what we hope for, there is no need to keep on hoping. However, we hope for something we have not yet seen, and we patiently wait for it. In certain ways we are weak, but the Spirit is here to help us. For example, when we don't know what to pray, for the Spirit prays for us in ways that cannot be put into words. All of our thoughts are known to God. God can understand what is in the mind of the Spirit, as the Spirit prays for God's people. May God add a blessing to this reading. Amen. Our theme, ooh, sorry about that. Our theme this morning is unseen, and I, I started thinking a little bit. Ooh, I didn't get all the way back dressed after the uh, <laughs> police officer costume. <laughs> sorry. Our theme is unseen. As a kid, I remember always uh, kind of. I don't know. I asked this question a lot. Perhaps you did too. If you could only have one of all the senses, which one would it be? And of course, smell, I get rid of that, no problem. I mean, you know, I like good smelling things, but it's not so bad to mute some of the other stuff, you know. Um, taste, I'd probably be a lot more healthy if I didn't have the sense of taste. <laughs> Even without that. Touch. It always came down to hearing and seeing to me. And if I had just seen Stevie Wonder or Ray Charles and saw how they feel that music, maybe I'd be swayed to hearing. But nine times out of ten, it was the sight I could not even fathom to be without. It's just, it seems so incredibly limiting and scary. We love the things we see. We like being able to rely on that, which is what makes this so difficult. The unseen things in our life that we're supposed to be able to believe in and trust. I want to talk about a little bit about that this morning. I, I laugh, I've been training for triathlons recently, and my triathlon coach is this incredible swimmer. She is, uh, we did a, the Iron Girl last year in Tahoe, and it's like a quarter mile swim, so it's kind of a short swim for some people not. Um, but with every uh, five minutes, the heats went off. So she was in the first heat, and I was in the second heat. So I'm standing at the, at the start line, ready to go, and she's getting out of the water already. She's a phenomenal swimmer. I couldn't believe it. Like five minutes, quarter mile done. It took me 11. <laughs> but the funny thing is, is, even though she's so unbelievably comfortable in the water, she will not swim in open water with goggles because she does not want to see what is in the water underneath her. Her whole thinking is, if I don't see it, it can't be there. <laughs> and we laugh about it, but come on now. Sometimes we just want to shut our proverbial spiritual eyes and say, no, it's not there. And nowhere in the Bible does it say, things get a little tough, it's okay, shut your spiritual eyes. No, it says the things that are unseen are the things that we hope for and look for. So this morning I wanted to talk actually about two unseen conditions that I think are, are mentioned here in our scripture about futility and about hope. The first one is futility. Um, the, I, I'm going to tell you, I wrote 12 sermons this week. <laughs> so difficult because how do you preach? When I preach I want to make people feel good. And I'm looking, we're groaning, and we're dying, and groaning, and childbirth, and, and it even says that creation yeah. is dying because of sin. We hear that the wages of sin are death, and we know that we as people have sinned, and so we, have, we as people have to experience death, but it goes so far beyond that. Creation, literally, look at the world. Yeah. You could tell the world around us is, is, is dying. Creation groans because of sin. That is like, ah, oh, the world is futile. 
At the beginning, God created the earth and said, it is good. And now here, after sin has affected it, it is dying. How sad is that? It's subjected to the same curse we are. Of course our bodies are futile. And I am reminded of that every morning I get out of bed now. My knees throb. My back aches. My shoulder sings the song that only my cereal used to sing. It's <laughs> not crackle pop. And I have to get up and, oh, okay, I think I'm ready. Because it's futile. My body is temporary. We get, we get diagnoses that remind us of that far too often. We have pains that we go, oh, that can't be good. Let me uh, see if we can stop that right now because it's futile. I want to say, particularly, we always say the wages of sin is death, and so, oh, you're dying, you're a sinner. We are all sinners saved by grace, thank God. Amen? Amen. But it's not because of one particular, you can't look at a person and say, oh, see, you must have sinned a lot worse than I did. <laughs> it's, the wages of sin, it's sin. It's humanity's sin. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's that wage of sin that, is, that makes us futile. Our plans are futile. I've heard it said that we make plans and God laughs. Yep. And, uh -huh. I don't necessarily think God's up there going, oh, did you see that plan they made? Um, but I do think that if we start making plans without the will of God in our life, without seeking the will of God, or with it being something other than the will of God, it's not going to work. I'll tell you, we, we, the, the, us in drag that you saw here this morning, <laughs> it wasn't just a video that we wanted to put together. It wasn't just we wanted to say, oh, um, you know, that's a good idea, let's do this. We have spent numerous hours in prayer about this. God, how do you want us to go? Direct our paths. If you don't go, we can't go. If you don't go, we don't want to go. Because if we make plans on our own, they will fail. It's futile. Now again, I know this sounds kind of like a bummer of a sermon, but I haven't got to hope yet. The second unseen is hope. And hope and futility cannot exist alongside each other. Hope is the world with God is knowing that what we do is predestined or planned. Awesome discipleship again. Every time I say this, I look at those of you who weren't here. I'm telling you, you've got to come and hear it. Yeah. That's right. That's right. We are chosen. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We have been given a purpose. That's hope. That's amazing and incredible hope. And I love the illustrations that Paul gives here in the scripture. Two illustrations I see. The one, the really obvious one is childbirth. Now I'm going to tell you, I know some of you have experienced this pain that is undescribable, <laughs> like beyond words, undescribable. I, it's, it really is. I think Bill Cosby did it the best when he said it's like taking a woman's upper lip and shoving it all the way around the head. Something terribly painful. But I'm going to tell you, it's the most incredible miracle of nature. As I held my baby in my arms, the pain was gone. Yep. Mm -hmm. It was like, no, it, it, that wasn't so bad. It was horrible. <laughs> I'm tell you, it was terrible. But it was gone like that. And it wasn't gone because the pain wasn't that bad. It was gone because the blessing was so much more amazing. Yes. And that's what Paul is saying. In fact, if you back up a little bit to verse... Wow, I may need glasses soon. <laughs> My Bible print just got really small. I'm futile. <laughs> if you back up to verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The pain is nothing compared to the present that will be. Isn't that incredible? That is hope. The second illustration Paul uses is saying that we are carrying the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, I gotta say, I have looked, I've you know read that. I don't know. First fruits seem to be one of those Christianese where you just never really think about. Um, oh yeah, first fruits. Okay, but first fruits really, it's it, the Israelites would take the first fruits back and say, look, this is the promise of an amazing harvest. We are carrying the promise of an amazing hope. That the Holy Spirit has put in our lives. That's, right. That's like powerful to me. Well, we are if we choose hope. We are not if we choose futility. Mm -hmm. 
the hope that the Holy Spirit is not only praying for us or with us, but in us and through us. <coughs> that the Holy Spirit is... I don't even know how to describe it, that the Holy Spirit is praying. It's not like me saying, hey, Pastor, I want to pray with you. It's like the Holy Spirit saying, oh, let me go inside you. I know your hurts. I know your needs. I know what God has for you. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. And that prayer turns into action. So it's futility or it's hope. And I wanted to say that these two unseen forces elicit very different reactions. Futility... We try to reverse. You, If you don't believe me, just get up in the middle of the night, or perhaps when you can't sleep, and turn on the infomercial channels. There's anti-aging. There's all kinds. I mean, you can go through hours of people trying to reverse the futility. They think, if I get the right prescription, I'm good. It's not going to work. I'm telling you, it's not going to work. They try, we try to, to reverse the, the damages on our environment and on our ozone. And I'm going to tell you, I believe we need to be um, protectors of the earth. But we're not going to be able to stop what happens. We, we need to be responsible, but we're not going to be able to reverse it. It's because the wages of sin is death. And once we can't reverse it, we just try to hide it. I was thinking... It just so works this way. Uh, on the day that Christine and I got married, um, I woke up with the biggest zit right here. On the it doesn't work that way. And I'm I, perhaps uh, this might surprise some of you, but I'm not really good with makeup. <laughs> so. Okay, it wasn't that funny. <laughs> Fortunately, I had a really good friend who was able to say, oh, I could take care of that, got cover up. You can't even tell on any of my pictures. It's amazing that you could cover it up so well. Yeah, I think we, we try to do that to our, to our spiritual self. So we're, we're, we're wasting away. Let's cover it up. Oh, cover it up with a big smile and nobody will know that I'm hurting inside. Oh, I know. I'll cover it up with a new sports car. I'll cover it up with, oh, so many things that we want to replace the futility with to hide it, to keep up with the Joneses, to make everybody think that life is good. But if we don't have hope, life can never be good, no matter how much we cover up. So if we can't reverse it, we can't cover it up, then we think, well, I'll just distract. I'll just take people's eyes off me. I know what I'll do. I'll point at her or him. I'll say, that person is worse than I am. Oh, see, I got it. fired up this Bring week. It. Bring it. You know, it's awesome what is going on in our nation. You know that the the NAACP um, now is is uh, backing same sex marriage. That's incredible that our president was willing to stand up and say, "I'm I'm for same sex marriage." Amazing and incredible. But as we take those incredible steps, then we have to hear. Absolute stupidity from other people. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I try to be more patient than that. But and I'm he'll hear me. I, I'm not. I know that's just kind of preaching to the choir. But I, I hopefully we could take it and say, oh, there are things that we do to point fingers too. Because see, it, we get our minds so much on the sin, and we forget about the salvation. Shouldn't we be talking about the salvation? Yes. We get our mind on the futile, and we never talk about the hope. Yes. There's a problem with that. God didn't say, I have come that you might tell people how they are wrong in every way. God said, I have come that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. We're supposed to be out there being the voice of salvation. Yes. That's what our call is. But instead, we get so focused on the futile, the finger pointing, the backbiting, the gossiping. <coughs> See, futility breeds hopelessness, and hopelessness breeds misery. So, if you're believing in the unseen futility, you probably have a good idea of where you are in that. You're miserable. Hope, on the other hand, promotes action. It's so funny that you had that on your PowerPoint. It promotes action. It must be picked up, and it must be carried on. 
I think about where the disciples were. We sell, today is Pentecost Sunday. We think about when the disciples, after Christ had risen back to, to heaven, they were all sitting in an upper room, and I'll just tell you, the scripture says they were in an upper room. So the rest is just my imagination going off. But I'm thinking, oh, they must, I, I can only imagine that they were in, the, in the, at the crossroad here of futility and hope. They could have said, what is going on? Our world has just been torn completely apart. Four days ago, I was sitting in an upper room getting my feet washed by my Messiah. And now he rose again, but he's gone again. What are we doing? They could have said, this is futile, I'm done, I quit. But they didn't. They waited for hope. For the hope that when you know, you're, it, whether it's because it's not seen, but you know it's coming, you can wait patiently. And so they were in an upper room waiting when the Holy Spirit came upon them. How powerful is that? Futility would have been an easy choice. Instead, they waited. Hope came. Hope came from the Holy Spirit, not just to comfort them, but to guide them, to lead them, to teach them to be sanctified individuals and beings. Their lives truly, from that point on, was never the same. I think that the church has completely forgotten about hope sometimes. Right? And I went off about this a little bit, but now it's in my notes, so I get to go off of it again. Um, I turn on the TV and I'm disgusted by the conversations all around. People who claim to be religious or godly people espousing views of hatred and judgment that are nowhere in the Bible. And I wonder what happened to their hope. To the pastor who wants to fence us all up until we die out, I say, sir, where is your hope? And it grieves me that you've lost it. To the churches that seek to exclude our theologies or, or races or sexualities or politics, I say, where is your hope? To those who want to criminalize the impoverished because they're annoying presence on our street, <laughs> where's your hope? When did you lose your hope? To the brothers or sisters who seek to spread rumors, uh, now I'm going to get a little closer to home, or gossip because they dislike someone else in church, to somebody who just wants to stir up a little dissension because it's fun, to somebody who is okay when somebody else doesn't walk in the door because they just didn't have the energy for them, where's your hope? It goes beyond. Amen. We've got to stop the games. We need to be a voice of hope. Right. We need to stand up and carry hope. And if there's dissension going on in church, then get up and talk about it. Right. And get over it. And remember that we're here to serve. We're here to carry a lamp of hope. That's why we're here. For those who think, hey, we're good with our little selves. We don't want to grow that scary. Where's your hope? Because there needs to be more people in here hearing about hope. Right. Reverend Elder Ken Martin once said, Can you imagine if your church would have decided to stop growing the week before you got there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to build up so we can build out, so we can reach in and give hope to people who need it. Right. To those who are completely comfortable never sharing your faith with your neighbor or your coworker or your friend, because you just don't want to step on that uncomfortable place of conversation. Where's your hope? You've got life inside of you. Give it away. To those who have forgotten that life is not futile, but that we have been given hope beyond futility, I urge you to remember that this powerful unseen force of hope can change your world. It is the powerful unseen force that will one day silence hatred. It is this powerful unseen force that will honor the meek. It is this powerful, unseen force that will end divisions one day. It is this powerful, unseen force that offers eternal life. Let's carry that powerful, unseen force with us as we go. Let's be the hope that others need.